Welcome to our next class, an Old Testament survey as part of the Grace Institute of Biblical Studies. We've been going book by book in canonical order through the Old Testament for this class. And the next book in the minor prophets that we've been studying is the book of Amos. We've already studied Hosea, Joel, and the next is Amos in order. But before we look at this tremendous short book of the Old Testament, let's just take a moment to pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word in this portion as well. The minor prophets, as we have already seen, are not minor in terms of their message. They carry a major message about your character, about human sin, and about your plan for redemption and restoration, even working through your chosen national people of Israel. We know you have a, another plan for the church, the age that we live in now. And we just pray that we would have attentive ears and hearts and eyes to see all that you want us to see on the pages of your word and apply it to our Christian life here and now, that we may glorify you and give honor and glory to our Savior who redeemed us as well, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray and we commit our time to you now for this lesson in Christ's name. Amen. The book of Amos is a tremendous book of the Old Testament. It's nine chapters and it packs a wallop in terms of its message. Very powerful. I'm calling him the plumb line prophet, not only because that has a nice ring to it, but because it conveys the message of the book of Amos very well also. Years ago, I heard a good Bible expositor refer to the book as such, Amos the plumb line prophet, and it stuck in my mind. And the more I've studied the book of Amos, I see how that description of Amos really fits. For a plumb line was used to measure whether a wall was straight or not. And we see in the book of Amos that Israel was not straight. They were crooked as a nation. And thus, they were out of line with the law of God, the word of God, and the will of God. And thus, they were ripe for God's judgment. And that's what we see throughout the book of Amos. It is a heavy book in terms of its message, a message of judgment that is coming, a message where the heart of God is just poured out pleading with his nation of Israel, his chosen people, to turn back to him and to seek him so that this judgment could be averted. For God is a God of mercy, a God of grace. He would rather forgive than judge. Now, as we think of Amos, let's go through this book in terms of the key components of the book, starting with the author of the book. The author is stated in chapter 1, verse 1, as Amos. It says in that verse, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. The author of this book, we have no reason to question, was the man Amos, who received this revelation. It says in verse 1, and interestingly, his name means burden, and how fitting for the message that God gave him to deliver. He had a heavy, weighty message of coming judgment on the nation of Israel that he needed to unload on that northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes at that time, as Israel was split between Judah and Benjamin in the south, and the ten northern tribes in the north, who are referred to as Israel in contrast to Judah. But of all the prophets that you study, proportionately, Amos has the highest percentage of negative content versus positive content of all the prophets, writing prophets in the Old Testament. What I mean by that is this, that as you study the prophets, they all have a message of coming judgment that they're warning the nations about. But it's also mixed with positive content in terms of how God will restore and provide salvation for the nation of Israel, and even the promise of a coming Redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so you see these things mixed within each prophetic book. But when it comes to the book of Amos, it's negative from chapter 1 in terms of a message of warning and judgment, and it takes you all the way up to the last chapter. In fact, you're getting halfway into the last chapter, and it's only the last five verses of the book before there is this promise of future redemption for the nation or restoration as a nation 
and the coming kingdom age. And so Amos, in a sense, is a cliffhanger when it comes to waiting for this positive content. So he has a message that is burdensome, and it suits his name. What else do we know about him personally? Well, it says here in verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel. Interestingly, he saw his message that he was to deliver. That means he received a divine revelation by way of vision, and God literally in vision form gave him the very words that he was to say and that formed the content of this book. In that sense, you could call this man not only a prophet, but a seer, S-E-E-R, a term that was used for one who would see a vision from the Lord and then as a prophet deliver that message. And so his calling and, and the contents of his message came directly from the Lord and that message was one of a burden that suits his name. Interestingly, as you look at some of the other prophets, they will sometimes refer to their content of their books as a burden from the Lord also, and something that they saw from the Lord. Nahum 1.1 is an example. It begins, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. See the words burden and vision mentioned there. Habakkuk begins the very same way. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, Habakkuk 1.1. And very interesting, here in Amos 1.1, it also says that Amos saw this message from the Lord that he was to deliver. And when the prophets speak of their content as a burden from the Lord, it's usually in the context of a message of coming judgment. This was something that was heavy on their hearts because it was heavy on the heart of of God himself. Now we also see from Habakkuk, excuse me, from Amos, chapter 1, verse 1, in terms of biographical content, that he was from among the sheep breeders of Tekoa. Now where was Tekoa in the land of Israel? It was in the south, just south of Jerusalem, so it would be within the tribal allotment of Judah, he was a Judahite, and Tekoa was about 10 to 15 miles southwest, south and a little bit west of Jerusalem. So that's where he was located. Now what does that tell us in terms of significance? Being from Tekoa, he was from nowhere. He, in essence, was from a, just a dot on the map. There was nothing significant about the town of Tekoa. He was from a small town and rather obscure. And interestingly, as you read chapter 1, verse 1, he never mentions his father's name also. And in that day, the father's name served in essence as like a last name, like, you know, uh, John's son today or Peter's son. In that day, you would refer to your name by a first name and then mention the first name of your father, Tom, the son of John, let's say. But here, he never mentions his dad's name. And again, that tells us that there's nothing significant about his lineage or background. He is a rather insignificant man in that regard. And what that also tells us is that God can use the foolish things of this world or things that the world doesn't esteem, the common man, he can use in a great way. And that gives many of us hope because we don't come from a place of significance as far as the world is concerned in terms of a lineage, in terms of reputation, in terms of money and financial background. In fact, it seems as though Amos was among the poor. He was a sheep breeder, it says. He was a fig farmer of sycamore figs, according to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we have a little more biographical content about him as well. Let's just turn there and read chapter 7 verses 10 through 17. In chapter 7, verse 10, we begin with Amaziah, who was priest in the town of Bethel. Bethel was among the northern ten tribes. And if you remember from our previous Old Testament lessons in the historical books of the Old Testament, Bethel was the center of a syncretistic 
false system of worship that Jeroboam I had set up. And throughout the Old Testament historical books, whenever Jeroboam I's name is mentioned, there's usually a phrase attached to him, who made Israel to sin. He set up this stumbling block of a system of worship to rival that which God had set up in Jerusalem in the tribe of Judah. And there are various reasons why Jeroboam set that up. But here we are a couple hundred years later after Jeroboam had set that false system up and it was still present in Israel and still a stumbling block to the people of Israel. And that system of false worship, that apostate system, had a false priest presiding over that system there in Bethel as well, and his name was Amaziah. And he was loyal to the king in the north, a king who was not righteous, who did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord, but that which is evil. So let's pick it up in chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. So we see that he's being threatened by Amaziah, the priest, to flee from the north. Go back to the south where you came from, and don't prophesy here. Now, why would you tell somebody to flee unless their life was in jeopardy or some bodily harm was being threatened to come to them? This was a threat to Amos, and thus he was a prophet who experienced persecution, just like almost all the other prophets. But it goes on to say in verse 14, then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. Those are some of the most famous words quoted from the minor prophets right there. He's saying, I don't have a claim to fame. I was not I was a prophet. God called me to be a prophet. But I was not part of the guild of the prophets, of the school of the prophets. I was not a professional prophet. I was not a trained prophet, per se. I did not come from a reputable school like some of the other prophets. Nor was I the son of a prophet. I don't have a reputation of being the son of somebody great. I'm just a common man, a nobody. And God loves to take a nobody to minister to everybody to show that he can use anybody. He says in verse 14, But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. I was a farmer, and God pressed me into the ministry of being a prophet. Verse 15, Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And by the way, tending sheep is a great form of training for being a minister for God because you get to know the nature of sheep. And people are likened to sheep throughout Scripture. We have many of the same tendencies. Going on, it says, verse 15, Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Amaziah, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Wow. This is a powerful prophet, and a man who wasn't afraid to pull punches, a man who knew he was commissioned by the Lord to preach, regardless of whether it was accepted or popular. And I think there's a message for us here in the Grace Institute for those of you who plan to be in ministry, a ministry of communicating the Word of God in whatever realm or sphere it may be, whether it's Sunday school teaching, whether it's teaching adult Bible studies, whether it's teaching over a pulpit or pastoral ministry, 
or even evangelism. The fact is, you need to know that you are called of God to do this and that you are speaking by way of conviction. Because if you're doing this to be accepted or approved by men, there will come a time very shortly where men don't approve of what you have to say and they'll reject you. And then at that point, you'll be tested as to whether or not you will continue in the ministry and continue to speak the uncompromised truth of the Word of God. And if you're really in it for the Lord's sake, you'll continue. You'll do it even if you're not getting paid. And it is revealed in the Old Testament prophets that there were false prophets among the people who were being paid. Prophets for hire who would tickle the ears of those in Israel and say, don't listen to Jeremiah, don't listen to Amos with their message of coming judgment. Everything's good and fine. God will not judge us. We're his chosen people. And they were false prophets. Again, if you're in it for the money, you will compromise. But if you're in it for the Lord's sake, you'll deliver the truth regardless of what you are paid and regardless of what it will actually cost you in terms of sacrifice in ministry. So it's very important that we do what we do as unto the Lord and not as unto men. He says here that he was a farmer. He wasn't from an established school of the prophets. And I find it interesting historically as you look at some of the men whom God greatly used from the last 150 years or so of church history, that they did not have formal theological training from a Bible college or a seminary, yet they thoroughly studied the Word of God and knew its contents. Men like C.I. Schofield, Lewis Berry Chafer, Harry Ironside, A.C. Gabeline, and others did not have formal theological training. And so if God could use such men with that background, he can use us as well. Again, he delights to use the common man who is humble in his sight and not taking pride in his education or his wisdom. So we see that this man was a genuine prophet. He saw his vision from the Lord. He was from a small, obscure town of Tekoa. He didn't have a great reputation in terms of his last name or his father's name or his educational background. Occupationally, he was not trained to be a prophet. He was a farmer, and he was persecuted. He was willing to stick his neck out on the line for the Lord. And so some of this biographical background is very helpful for us to see the character of this man. Now, as we see in the book of Amos, a little more information about him. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, where he was called to preach. We already saw that in chapter 7 with Amaziah as he went up to Bethel in the north, which was the heart and center of that apostate religious worship system, and there he delivered his message. But it was specifically to the ten northern tribes called Israel, sometimes called Samaria in the book of Amos, that Amos was called to go. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, of Israel, against the whole house of the family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, and he goes on. So though he does address Judah in his prophetic writing, he was primarily called to go to the ten northern tribes of Israel. Why? Because they would be facing judgment first in 722 B.C. with the Assyrians who would come and take them captive. In chapter 4, we also see where he was called to preach. Chapter 4, verse 1 begins, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. And Bashan was up in the north, on the other side of the Jordan, um, basically on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, on the eastern side, in that region around just north of Gilead. It was a very lush region and prime uh, real estate for raising cattle. So they would become fat, very rich and abundant area for raising cattle. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, 
who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your prosperity with fish hooks and bring you into judgment is the message. One thing we see about this man, Amos, is he's a very clear and vivid writer and illustrator. These images that he puts into the mind of the reader are powerful and easy to understand compared to some of the other prophets, even like Micah, who's similar in his content, but yet his style of writing is a little less clear. Amos is perfectly clear in, in many passages here, and it's powerful. In fact, he is about the most blunt of the prophets that you can read in the Old Testament. He ca calls the women of the northern ten tribes cows, cows of Bashan. Imagine that. Can you imagine a preacher today saying something like that? I can't think of a more politically and culturally incorrect message to convey. You know, sometimes I have heard Christians say that we should never refer to people as animals because that is inherently unchristian and ungracious. And yet, do you realize that not only did Amos call these women cows, but even in the New Testament, under the age of grace, there were times where the biblical writers or speakers would refer to people who, because of their sin and rebellion against God, are likened to animals. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, don't give that which is holy to the dogs, and don't cast your pearls before swine. So who are the hogs and who are the dogs? Jesus was clearly referring to people. And then in chapter 23 of Matthew, the Lord Jesus himself says of the wicked Pharisees who are out to kill him, he says, you serpents, you offspring or brood of vipers. And it wasn't just the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beware of dogs, the evil workers, the mutilation, the botched circumcision. Now again, very graphic and unflattering terminology that's used to describe people who were in outright rebellion against God. Likewise, Paul says in Titus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, that the Cretans are lazy, liars, and evil beasts. Evil beasts. And then he goes on to say, this testimony is true. So the Bible does sometimes depict people in terms of being likened to animals. And so it's not inherently wrong or unchristian even to say that at times. Now I don't, and it's clarifying all that, I don't think we should be quick to go around calling people by such graphic descriptions. But at times, there is a place for it, according to these biblical writers and speakers. And it's not inconsistent with a God of grace, lest we say that the Lord Jesus or the Apostle Paul were out of line. And I say that because I have heard Christians say, again, that there's never a place for that in this world, even calling, for instance, the MS-13 gang from El Salvador animals. And by the way, they have a reputation for rape and murder, and they pride themselves on doing that. And they have been called animals as such, and some Christians have said, oh, that's so ungracious to call them animals. It's dehumanizing. And yet, the biblical writers and speakers use the same type of terminology. And I think we need to be careful not to be, in our minds, we think, more loving and more gracious than even God, because then it shows we have a standard of love and grace that isn't consistent with the Word of God. A loving God calls a spade a spade in order that men may repent and be horrified for who they really are. To be like Job, who sees himself in light of who the holy God is, and repents in sackcloth and ashes, it says there at the end of Job. 
And so this is some interesting, necessary biographical background about this man, Amos, as well as how he prophesied and to whom he prophesied. In terms of when he prophesied, let's look at the date of the book of Amos. This book was written approximately 755 B.C. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, that he prophesied or received this vision from the Lord in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And if that were not enough, he goes on to specify this was two years before the earthquake. Now, first of all, when did Uzziah, king of Judah, reign? He reigned historically, we know, from 792 to 740 B.C. Jeroboam II, up in the north, reigned from 793 to about 753 B.C. We also have discovered, or we haven't, but archaeologists who study the land of Israel have seen evidence for an earthquake that they estimate would have occurred at about 760 B.C. during the days of Uzziah. And this earthquake was so destructive and, and significant in the history of Israel that another prophet, some 200 years later, named Zechariah, in chapter 14, verse 5 of his book, makes reference to this same earthquake that occurred. Can you imagine 200 years later referring back to an historical event? And so this was a significant destructive earthquake. Now, if God gave a vision to Amos two years before the earthquake, roughly 762 B.C., then this would give time for Amos to deliver his message in the north of coming judgment, as well as to write down his book. And thus, most scholars date this book at about 755 B.C. Why is this a significant date? Because it tells us what Israel was like when Amos would have gone and delivered his message of judgment. Israel was a land that was at its zenith in terms of its economic standard of living. It had a high level of living. It was not a downtime. The economy was good. Things were looking up. In fact, under Jeroboam II, Israel in the north had expanded its territory back to roughly the boundaries that it had during the days of Solomon and his kingdom, almost 200 years before. They had military might. And all of this was looking good. They had no idea that within roughly 30 years of Amos writing this book, three decades would come the Assyrian armies from the north who would sweep down and take captive completely the ten northern tribes. Only three decades away. I think that tells us a valuable lesson as well, that we should not live based on what we see horizontally here in terms of circumstances. Don't interpret life by your circumstances, but rather by the word of God. Because things may look good on the outside, but as God sees them, they were spiritually rotten as a nation and ripe for judgment like fruit that was ready to be picked. And it's interesting, throughout the book of Amos, there are several warnings of coming judgment on Israel and Samaria. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Chapter 6, verse 7 and verse 14. Chapter 7, verse 17. Chapter 9, verse 4. Let's look at one particular prediction of coming judgment in chapter 5, verse 27. It's very specific and very telling as to the direction of where this coming judgment would be from. Chapter 5, verse 27, Therefore I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Beyond Damascus. From the standpoint of Israel, as you look at a map geographically, where was Damascus? Damascus, Syria, was to the north and the east. But beyond Damascus, as you continue in that same line or direction, would be the rising empire 
of Assyria. This was a very specific prediction of who the conquerors would be as the instrument of God's chastening hand upon the nation of Israel. In 722 B.C., this people would come. And so Amos predicted all of this decades in advance. And though he may have had his message rejected and personally rejected in his time, as the decades went on and the predictions he makes throughout the book came true, it validated him as a genuine prophet of God. And no doubt, his book was vindicated as the inspired, inerrant word of God that was worthy to be part of the canon of Scripture and it became recognized as such. Moving on to our next main point in terms of the introduction to the book of Amos, what is the trigger word for this book? Well, it comes right from the description of the book that I gave you at the very beginning, that Amos is the plumb line prophet. The trigger word for Amos is plumb line. Where does this come from? It comes from chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, where he uses the illustration or figure of a plumb line four times in these short verses to make a spiritual point. In chapter 7, let's read verses 7 through 9. Thus he showed me, the Lord showed me, Amos is saying, Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. The dynasty and the kingdom of the north would be toppled. As great and powerful as it was in his day, it would come to an end. And God would be the one who would judge. But four times the phrase plumb line is used in chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And as we think of a plumb line, what was it used for historically? It's still used today as a way of measuring whether something is straight. Oftentimes when we're seeking to do construction, we use what's called a chalk line, where we pull it tight on one end and tight on the other, and we lay it horizontally on the ground, and we, we snap that line on the ground, and it lays a chalk mark in a straight line. And we can use that for construction purposes. And the same was true vertically with the line, where you would have a, a string, and on that end of that string would be a weight, that would pull that string tight gravitationally towards the center of the earth. It would do that naturally through natural forces, and so you could measure vertically a straight line, and you would hold that up against a wall, and if there was a space between the string and the wall, you knew you had a crooked wall. And the Lord is saying, look, the land of Israel is crooked. They don't line up with my plumb line. And thus, they are a wall that needs to be torn down and rebuilt. And this was a figure of coming judgment. What this tells us is that God has such a plumb line to tell us what is true and what is right. And that standard of what is truth is the word of God. If you recall from our study of the book of Hosea, they had turned away from the knowledge of the Lord through the law or the word of God. They had considered the law of God a strange thing in the north. And they had rejected God's word. And that's why the word of God is needed, even in our day, to tell us what is true and what is right. We are able to know right from wrong, uh, God's will versus our will, sin versus righteousness, by studying the word of God. Because we live in a day that has been dubbed the postmodern age. And one of the axioms of postmodernism is that there is no absolute truth. What may be right for you is not necessarily what's right for me. There is no absolute right versus wrong. And yet we have in the Word of God, God's unchanging, infallible, authoritative Word that tells us right from wrong. And that is so needed even when it comes to this area of social justice, 
that has become a, a, a buzz phrase in evangelicalism here in the United States in the last couple of decades. And my concern when it comes to this issue of social justice is not that we are um, corporately as a church failing to fulfill biblical standards of justice, but rather that the church corporately is following the world's standard of what is socially just. And we'll cover this more in detail when we get to the book of Micah, who also addresses this subject. But Amos deals quite a bit with the mistreatment of the poor and the oppression by the rich through deceit and through violence to oppress those who were socially less privileged. But my concern again is that the standard of what was true justice for Amos, for Hosea and the other prophets, Micah, was the word of God itself, the law that God had given to Israel that they were not following. And so we need to be careful as a church today not to follow the world's definition of what is just and right and impose that on the church and make the church follow the world's standards, which I think is what's happening in a large measure. Rather, we should interpret the world's standards of what is just or right through the word of God. Is justice culturally defined or biblically defined? That's the bottom line issue. Now, as we think of key verses for the book of Amos, chapter 4 contains a key verse, as well as chapter 8, verses 11 through 12. And in chapter 4, Amos gives a warning again to the people of Israel. And in verse 12, he says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. That's an ominous warning because they would meet the Lord in terms of judgment. But prior to that, in the context, Amos has said multiple times through pleading, return to the Lord, return to the Lord, turn to the Lord. And we've seen this already with Hosea and the other prophets, this concept of turning back to the Lord from the heart. Rend your heart and not your garments, the Old Testament says. But in Hosea, excuse me, in Amos chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Also, I gave you uncleanness of teeth in all your cities and a lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. And note how many times this phrase returned occurs. It's in verse 6, verse 7. I also withheld rain from you when there was still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, that part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. By the way, was drought a form of God's chastening, according to the Old Testament? Even in the book of Deuteronomy, it predicted that. In Leviticus, yes, that was the case. They were not responding to God's chastening. Verse 9, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees. The locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. We saw from the book of Joel that locusts were also a means of God's chastening to get Israel to turn back to him, to awaken them out of their spiritual lethargy and from their rebellion, but they would not. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 12, therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God. O Israel. How would they need to prepare? By turning in their hearts in faith from whatever it was they were trusting in and they were under apostasy and idolatry. They were trusting in themselves. They were prideful to turning back to the Lord from their sin and to the Lord. And this was a warning and it was a warning not given because God is a harsh God at all, but it was actually an act of mercy. And I think it's important that we see that. 
Because sometimes as we read these things in the Old Testament, we think, wow, God is a strong, uh, negative God of judgment. He wouldn't have to do this if it wasn't needed. It was needed, but they didn't realize that. And so this was an act of mercy on his part, so they would be spared from the coming judgment. And what you see throughout Scripture is that God provides a grace period for people to turn to him before the judgment hits. And he even sends messengers ahead of time to warn of this, that they would turn back to him. The judgment could be averted. The problem was they were despising this message. They were not returning to him. And that's why in chapter 5, as you go on, there are three passages in verse 4, verse 6, and verse 14, where he tells them to seek me and live. And if they would not seek him, they would continue in the same direction they were on and be headed right towards a path of destruction. What was the problem here? The problem was that they were not heeding God's messengers through the written word and the spoken word through the prophets. In chapter 8, it goes on to say this. Here's another key passage from the book. Verses 11 through 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Now you might say, well, why would God hide his word from people who needed it? That seems inconsistent with his character. Well, do you realize that he is predicting what will happen as a result of their choice? They would despise the word of God to such an extent that it would become forgotten in the land of Israel. As they were carried away in captivity, deported to other nations, there would be a spiritual void in the north. The prophets would become silent in the north as the people of Israel were gone. And that's why we see their reaction towards the prophets in chapter 2 of Amos. Look at chapter 2 and verse 11. The Lord says, I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. And then he goes on to say, as a result of your despisal, of this prophesying, that they would be judged. They told the prophets to shut up, silence, go back to Judah. And by saying that, God says, if that's how you're going to be over and over again, then you will get what you want. And there will be a spiritual famine of the word of God in the land of Israel. So those are the key verses from the book. The theme of Amos is the coming judgment on Israel because of God's holiness. Chapter 4, verse 2 had mentioned that. And the persistent sin of his covenanted, and I would add, unrepentant people. They persisted in their sin because they would not turn to the Lord from their hearts. That is the theme of the book of Amos. And we've seen that already. What about the structure or basic outline of the book of Amos? Well, there's three main sections to this book. There are, in chapters 1 and 2, judgments upon the nations. And not merely nations, but remember, nations were like city-states back then. So you have two cities that are mentioned of these eight in chapters 1 and 2. You have Tyre, which was to the north and east of Israel. You also had Damascus, which to, to the north, excuse me, Damascus was to the north and east. Tyre was to the north and west along the Mediterranean coast. But what Amos does in chapters 1 and 2 is he goes in the circumference around the land of Israel, naming these hostile adversaries who had coming judgment upon them. He mentions Damascus, which was the farthest of them all away, then Gaza, where the Philistines were from, then Tyre, remember Tyre and Sidon up in Phoenicia, and then he mentions Edom to the south 
and then Ammon, Moab, and he mentions Judah, the seventh to the south, because the prideful Israelites in the north would have looked down on those in the south. And, and at this point, as people are reading the book of Amos, who are part of Israel in the north, they're shaking their heads saying, yeah, yeah, God, you, you pour out your judgment on, on Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and, and Edom and Ammon and Moab, and yeah, even those rebels who were separated from in the south, those in Judah, but we're good. And he mentions Israel last of the eight. So he goes in a circumference, naming all these other nations or city-states until he comes to Israel last. And he reserves the most amount of content in terms of his prophesying of judgment for guess who? Israel compared to those other nations. It's as though he's circling like a hawk over its prey, getting the reader from the northern ten tribes to agree with him until it dawns on them, wow, I'm in line for judgment too. I'd better turn to God. Israel is mentioned last, and it's the longest section in the book. Why? Because they were the ones primarily whom God was addressing through Amos. And what this should show, should have shown Israel is that they were no better than those other nations around them. They were guilty of the very same things that incurred God's just judgment. And you know, we're in a very bad state when we think we're inherently better than other people. The message of the book of Romans in the New Testament in chapter 3 is that all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We are all under sin, whether Jew or Gentile, and thus we are all in need of the grace of God. And we better not forget that lest we no longer view ourselves as debtors to the grace of God and the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was the nation of Israel like at this time? Why were they ripe for judgment? Well, as you read the book of Amos, you will see robbery, violence, greed, extortion, bribery, oppression, suppression of the righteous prophets and their message, religious idolatry and hypocrisy, and all of these things were manifestations of their pride. That's why it says in chapter 8, verses 4 through 7, Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, When will the new moon be passed, that we may sell grain, get back to business is the idea, and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The poor and the needy who owed only about the amount of a, a pair of shoes, sandals, were being taken into slavery as indentured servants because of something as minor as that, it seems. But what was the root problem behind all this? The very next verse says, verse 7, The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. The broad, bottom line problem, the root problem, was pride. And so eight judgments are mentioned against the nations in chapters 1 and 2. The outline of the book also goes on in chapters 3 through 6 to give three sermons against the land of Israel. And it's interesting that each of these sermons begins with the word hear, the exhortation to hear the word of God. Chapter 3, verse 1, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. Chapter 4, verse 1, hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria. Chapter 5, verse 1, hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. And that word here, here, here is the word Shema in Hebrew, and that should be familiar to you because of the great Shema that was given to the people of Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And what was the root problem? Pride manifesting itself 
by way of not hearing the word of God. They had despised the word of God. And thus, the only thing left when you turn off your ears to God is discipline from the believer. His people Israel were in line for divine discipline because they were saying, God, we don't want to hear you. And God says, I will be heard. And so he spanks his own children, so to speak. They were in line for divine discipline or chastening. Just as, again, Deuteronomy and Leviticus had predicted would be the pattern centuries prior. So there are three sermons against Israel. And the last portion of this book in chapters 7 through 9 are five visions of judgment coupled with a promise of restoration at the end of the book. What are the five visions of judgment? There are locusts mentioned in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, again, hearkening back to the prophecy of Joel. That was a form of divine discipline. Fire is mentioned in chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. The plumb line is mentioned in chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. And then ripe summer fruit in a basket is used as a figure in chapter 8, as they were ripe for judgment. And then stricken doorposts in chapter 9. And so that is the basic structure of the book. And I mentioned at the outset, as we think of the book of Amos, that though it has a high percentage of negative content, it ends on a positive high note spiritually with the promise of coming redemption and restoration. When would this take place? In the future millennial kingdom. Let's read chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, how the book ends. Let me just back up and mention chapter 9, verse 8, because there's a significant statement there as well. In chapter 9, verse 8, Amos says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. And why would that be the case? Because though God may destroy a generation of Israelites in his chastening, like he did with the Exodus generation with 40 years until their carcasses dropped in the wilderness, he will be faithful to his promise for the nation as a whole, long-range fulfillment. And he will fulfill his promises through those, the gracious Abrahamic covenant promise as well as the other covenants that he has made. So Israel, though it may be chastened throughout its history, is indestructible as a nation. And history has borne out the truth of that, even as we think of how the Jews have been treated the last 2,000 years. And yet they're back in their land. Amazing. But it's just as God said, I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. Go, skip down to verse 11, and let's read verses 11 through 15. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And that will be the lineage of David restored to rule and reign as king over Israel. And I believe with that will be the rebuilt tabernacle or temple that we see in Ezekiel 40 through 48. All of that will come to pass when? In the millennial kingdom, when Jesus Christ has returned to the earth. And I will repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins. Notice, I will, I will. Who's going to accomplish this? Not Israel, but God will do this, and he will do it in grace because they've been an unworthy nation. He is a God of grace. And I will rebuild it as in the days of old, he says. Verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. They'll have all the land that they were promised, including what was currently the land of Edom. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. Why would that be the case? Because the land would be bursting with productivity, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. By the way, as we think of wine, remember the Lord Jesus? His first miracle recorded in the book of John was that he turned water into wine at Cana, which was evidence that the kingdom of God was being offered to Israel because the king was here. Kingdom conditions were being manifested with the presence of Jesus Christ 
that was proof that he was the genuine Messiah. And so going on, it says, verse 14, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. There'll be a return to the land. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land that I have given them, says the Lord God. And so though God would carry away captive the ten northern tribes, he promises that there'll be a day, the kingdom age, where they will be brought back to the land and he will establish them there in fulfillment of all his gracious promises. What this also tells us is that God has a future plan for Israel as Israel, as a national entity, not the same as the church. Because there are those who teach what's called covenant premillennialism, who believe that, and they're non-dispensationalists, they don't see a distinction between Israel and the church. And they say, yes, Israel has a future, but only as it's incorporated into the church. And so there will be a millennial kingdom age, but only for the church, not national Israel. That's called replacement theology. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Now, I need to clarify one other passage. It's from the New Testament. Because in Acts chapter 15, at the Jerusalem Council, there James, the presiding elder of the church at Jerusalem, makes a comment about the book of Amos. And he quotes from Amos 9, 11 through 15. And he compares the church to what is described there. And some have used that quotation by James as justification for equating Israel and the church, or saying that Israel's promises are fulfilled in the church now. And that is not at all what is being stated there. What does that passage say? Let's read it together. Acts 15, verses 13 through 17. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, that would be Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, quote, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Why was this quoted by James? And what was the purpose of the meeting in Acts chapter 15? Remember, they were convening as elders and apostles because this issue of keeping the law came up. Do the Gentiles have to keep the law to be saved? And the emphatic answer by those at the council was no. James, Peter, and the rest agreed, no. The Gentiles don't have to keep the law of Moses, which was covenanted just to the people of Israel, that they might be saved. They can be saved apart from the law by faith in Jesus Christ, just as we Jews were justified, they say. So the issue was, where do the Gentiles fit in, in the plan of God? They became part of the church. The church is made up of Jew and Gentile in Christ. And so the reason why James quotes from Amos 9 here is because God says here that there is a future for the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles can turn to the Lord and be saved. And in a passage from Amos 9 dealing with the future kingdom age, when Jew and Gentile will dwell together in the millennial kingdom, he's saying the church age agrees with that coming kingdom age. Notice what it says right here in, in Acts chapter 15. And with this, all the words of the prophets agree. In other words, they're consistent with what Amos says. Note what James is not saying. He is not saying that Amos 9 is being fulfilled today in the church age. It's very important to note that. And so, though, what we see from all of this in Amos 9 is that the book ends on a very positive, high note, giving the people of God hope for the future. That when the Messiah comes, there will be this restoration of the people of Israel to their land. There will be environmental conditions where the curse upon planet Earth will be lifted and things will prosper. And Israel 
will be the head of the nations at that time, never in danger or jeopardy of being persecuted by other nations again. They will live in prosperity in the land that God has promised to them. And so the book ends by giving people hope. And I think we see from all of this, again, the character of God. That though he is a righteous God and he will not tolerate unrepentant, ongoing sin, there will be judgment and chastening. He is also a gracious God, sending forewarning and messengers to turn back to him. And even after the judgment has come, there is still the promise of a, a grace offer for the future. This is the God we serve, and this is the God described by Amos, the plumb line prophet. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. This is a great book. Though it has a high percentage of negative content, it has a powerful message, a message that we need to heed even today that has application to us today, not directly, but indirectly. And thank you that you are the same God, the God of all grace from age to age, and how you've demonstrated that through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. We thank you that he came the first time to pay for all our sin. And we thank you that he's coming again. And even so, come Lord Jesus.